I'm Asia Gore. You're watching Buckeye TV's Rivalry Game Live Special. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brad Comer. And for the 109th time, Michigan and Ohio State will collide on the gridiron on November 30th to continue a tradition simply known as the game. That's right. It's just 10 days away tonight. We are going to share with you all the viewers the many different elements that this, give this game the grit and glory. We'll talk with some Buckeye legends about their thoughts on what makes this regular season finale so important. And our Buckeye TV and Lantern reporters will bring you stories of the history, Mirror Lake Jump, Game Insiders, and so much more. The rivalry between the Buckeyes and the Wolverines runs deep, established in 1897 when the teams first met. There is no love between these two programs. The magnitude of this matchup between the Scarlet and Gray, Maize and Blue is arguably one of the most cutthroat rivalries in not just college football, but in all sports. What led to these two iconic helmets to clash every season? Dan Hope joins us from the shoe to tell us where it all began. Since their first meeting in 1897, the Ohio State and Michigan football teams have met 109 times in a game considered to be one of college football's greatest rivalries. It's the greatest sporting event in this country uh, any year. Ohio State alumnus and football historian Jack Park believes the competition between the Buckeyes and the Wolverines has made the two teams better. If you don't have competition, you'll never be as good as you can be if you do have competitions. The rivalry hasn't always been competitive, however. Ohio State did not win over Michigan until the 16th game of the series, and that was in 1919, and behind the play of uh, legendary halfback Chick Harley, Ohio State went up and won at Michigan in 1919. And uh, actually, in the first 15 games before that, there were 13 Michigan victories and two ties, and Michigan had outscored Ohio State over those 15 games by a score of 369 to 21. One of the defining eras in the OSU-Michigan rivalry was the Ten-Year War, a span from 1969 to 1978 in which Woody Hayes coached OSU and Bo Schembechler coached Michigan, with Michigan winning five games, OSU winning four, and the teams tying once in 1973. Uh, those were really 10 unbelievable games, and that took the Ohio State-Michigan uh, series to a, certainly a new level. Another defining aspect of a rivalry are its traditions, such as the annual jump into Mirror Lake by OSU students. Around the state of Ohio, you can always see the, the pride for Ohio State, and I love that. And um, We have Mirror Lake night here on campus, and it's just awesome. Even students who came to Ohio State without much knowledge of the rivalry have come to learn its significance. I didn't even know that our rival colors were blue and yellow until I was already attending school here. So for me, I'm kind of like out of the loop. But, uh, you know, I still jumped in Mirror Lake last year. In recent years, the rivalry has tilted in Ohio State's favor. The Buckeyes have won 11 of the last 15 matchups between the teams, dating back to 1998. Overall, Michigan holds a 58-44 to advantage in the series, which has also had six ties. For Buckeye TV, I'm Dan Hope. As you just saw, the rivalry between these two teams is something that goes beyond a casual game of tossing the pigskin. The tradition behind the game is present throughout many different aspects of Ohio State's culture. Perhaps one of the most well-rehearsed elements of the culture was heard after every game this season, our very own alma mater, Carmen Ohio. Chelsea Spears tells us more about the melody that truly puts the fans in tune with their school spirit. get this flood of memories that come back so fast you can't pinpoint them and the next thing you know it's over. Carmen, Ohio. It's a song steeped in Buckeye history that dates back to more than a hundred years ago, beginning in Ann Arbor. This is about the rivalry between Ohio State and Michigan. Because it all started when the Wolverines beat the Bucks. So they thought they were going to go up there and win. Well they go up and they get beat 86 to nothing. So on the way back Fred starts writing the song uh, Carmen, Ohio. That was in 1902 when OSU freshman Fred Cornell first penned the lyrics to the song. But Dr. Robert Stevenson, an OSU alum and assistant professor at Ohio State, has done his research on the song and he says it didn't catch on right away. The song kind of disappeared until 1906. A lantern printed the words and some students sang it around a bonfire. And then they sang it at the Michigan game, and it's been sung in every game since. And it's not just for football games. Today, anyone walking across the Ohio Union can read the lyrics of Carmen, Ohio, written all across the inside of the building. Now it's a song that many Ohio State students know by heart, and a song that even new students like Haley understand. When everybody sings the song, it kind of brings us together as a community. It really embodies 
Ohio State. Stevenson agrees that it's more than just a song. It's about the feeling. For 60 seconds, wherever you are, uh, you're back in Ohio. Chelsea Spears, Buckeye TV. You know the game is still 10 days away, but students are preparing for an OSU tradition that is just right around the corner. The Mirror Lake Jump is this coming Tuesday, a night where thousands of students will take the plunge into the lake in support of the Buckeyes. You know, despite frigid temperatures, the Good Luck Jump is one that fires Buckeye fans up for many years. Will you be taking the dip, Brad? You know, if it was July or sometime warmer, I'd very well be doing the jump. How about yourself? Well, it's my last semester here, and I haven't done it yet, so I might... Well, there are a few pointers every OSU fan should know before taking the big dip. Luckily for you, Asia, our very own Andrew Henderson shares a few things that you might should know. Mirror Lake is typically a peaceful area on campus where students can stop to read a book, the ducks have an area to swim, and students can pass by to get to class. But for one night in November, this otherwise calm place on campus makes a rapid turn. It's called Mirror Lake Jump. According to OSU's website, the first jump took place in 1990 and has become a tradition ever since to honor the OSU-Michigan football rivalry. It's a good tradition. I had family to go here and it's always been something to, uh, something to try, especially being a Buckeye instead of just hearing about it all the time. It's really fun with all your friends and you get to come out and whether or not you're drinking, it's, I don't know, it's fun. It's an OSU tradition, so it's cool to come out and partake in it. Although students look forward to this night, the Office of Student Life has sent out a university-wide email in the past making it clear the university does not encourage this event. In November 2011, the subject of such email read, please don't jump in Mere Lake. It went on to say it's not a university-sponsored event and a high-risk activity. Last year, it cost the university more than $46,000 to repair Mere Lake Jumpers left the grass trampled, which accounted for almost half of that total cost. Uh, usually some fencing needs to be repaired. Sometimes some of the furniture around it needs to be repaired. Last year we did have to repair some of the limestone caps that go around the sides of the lake. And then there's usually a pretty significant effort to repair and replace damaged grass around the area. She says OSU Police Division, Franklin County Sheriff's Office, water rescue personnel, and EMS and medical crews will all be on scene the night of the jump. They usually do make anywhere from about a dozen to, in some cases, up to 20 medic runs each night. Um, injuries can range from lacerations to you know, injuries associated with falling. Um, and then something else really important to think about, and this isn't always reported through the medic runs, um, but hypothermia is a really big factor depending on the temperature. Reporting for Buckeye TV, I'm Andrea Henderson. Those are definitely some important things to consider. I might have to have someone waiting nearby with a heated blanket and some disinfectant. Well, too bad you don't live in the dorms. You could just run back to your room after the big jump. Well, I'm sure that's what a lot of students have in mind. We're joined now by some special guests who have some firsthand experience with the jump. Thanks for being with us, guys. All right, uh, I'll just go ahead and start. Uh, every year when you do jump, it's mid-November. What possibly motivates you to jump in? You know, I guess you can call it a lake that you know, it's honestly not warm. It's, it's freezing cold. Like, what, what motivates you to go out and do that exactly? Um, it's all the chanting and, like, friends amping you up and all that. You just get in the mood and jump, and then you don't really realize it until you're in, so it's not a big deal. I also think it's the challenge because it is so cold, and that's why people want to do it. And if it was just warm, it wouldn't have that thrill that everyone has with the cold, piercing water. No, I'll do anything to beat Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> and now, Liana, you're an RA, so tell us what it's like uh, being an RA and waiting for all your residents to come back at night. Um, it's actually really exciting. We do a lot of preparations. Um, we line the elevators in the hall of uh, trash bags. We have like pancakes and food for them. So once they start coming in, we hose them off um, so we, they don't track uh, dirt into the building. But then we see the excitement that all the students come in and we just give them food, um, get them towels, warmth, and it's a very exhilarating community that um, this event brings in the residence hall. And it's very cool to see that many people have that school spirit um, after the jump. And are you guys like really there to help them out and get them warm or do you have any sort of um, policies like to get them in trouble that might be in place? 
Um, it's more for us just to make sure everyone's being safe. We want everyone to have fun. Um, it isn't a university sanctioned event, but we, we see that this is a fun activity that a lot of students participate in. So I think our main goal is to make this enjoyable for the students, but also look for their safety and in case they need anything that we're there for them. Yeah, and I'm sure it's got to be a little overwhelming too with all those students coming back in the door as well. Uh, for those who have jumped, once you get in the lake and you get out, what's the first thing on your mind after taking the big jump once you get out of the water? Uh, I really just think about joining in like on the chance and I don't know, usually I'm looking at the guy in the middle of the lake who's floating around wondering how he's still out there. That's about it. I don't know, I just can't wait to jump again. Um, after I jumped my freshman year, I just kind of wanted to jump again. <laughs> Even though it was that cold, it was just, it was fun. And afterward, you're just like, okay, now it's time for a warm shower and food. Now, will any of you be jumping again this year? Definitely. Of course. I cannot. As an RA, we're on call, unfortunately. So. Yeah. And um, so preparing for, tonight, or for the big night, uh, what what sort of things go into that? Are you going to bring like a backpack full of blankets, maybe some hand warmers? Uh, I would be bringing some sort of spray to you know clean off the, oh, yeah. the gross water. Uh, I'm I usually just wing it. I don't really prepare much. Just get ask my friends if they're going to do it, and that's about it. I'm with them on that one. I'm not jumping, but I'm there preparing food, setting out cloths of towels and anything else for the students so yeah all right well thank you guys so much for joining us we really appreciate it um, after the break we're talking about one of the most important parts of this rivalry game and every game for that matter which happens to be you the fans stick around you may just see a few familiar faces you might know and if you've been a fan all your life you'll recognize a couple of these next Buckeye legends stay tuned have to be here very long to know that this Buckeye thing is amazing. Doesn't matter if you think you don't have spirit, you will, because it's everywhere and it's contagious. It's really hard to put your finger on it, but it's just a feeling that you don't get until you realize that you are a student or a faculty member at one of the greatest universities in the world. I love Ohio State University. I think it is a grand institution. There is a spirit about Buckeyes that I think resonates throughout the world. It just hits you when you walk on this campus, the feeling that people have and that they carry with them for generations. That's what the tradition does. This is the Rivalry Game special here on Buckeye TV. I'm Asia Gore. And I'm Brad Comer. Thanks for tuning in this evening. Now, we wouldn't even be having this special if it weren't so important to so many people out there. The fans, the supporters who get up early every Saturday morning to tailgate, drive several hours. And some of you even fly to the games. Cheering from the stands in scorching hot temperatures. And the freezing cold. You, the fans, are really what makes this game considered the greatest rivalry in all of college sports. Some fans in particular, their passion is to a whole different level. If you've been to a Buckeye football game, there may be some faces that stick out to you in the stands. Alexandria Chapin reported on a lot of the home games this season, and she is just the person to tell us about the Buckeyes' biggest fans. You've probably seen this super fan if you've been to an OSU game, but how does a Buckeye fan become a super fan? Locally, uh, back in Sandusky County, Northwest Ohio, um, I live in Fremont, and uh, we, did, we did a fundraiser for our local high school in 1995, so I've been best dressed contest, and the grand prize was a basket of cookies by the local cookie lady, and the big nut likes to eat. And then the uh, following year, they had uh, a three-foot-high Buckeye snowman for your Buckeye man cave or rec room. And I had to win it, and I knew it was going to be a tough contest because all these little old ladies had the stitch cardigan sweaters and the stitch pants, and they, I mean, they were awesome looking. So that's why I started doing the face paint. 
And then um, in 2002, in the championship game uh, out in Tempe against uh, uh, Miami of Florida, um, that was the first game that I actually painted up for the, uh, the Buckeyes and uh, for the Buckeye Nation. Roughly 15 years ago, uh, actually it was in 1998, I had a ticket that was in the Michigan section, row one, and we had a little bit of fun. We come up with the name. We took Brutus Buckeye. That's where I got the Buckeye from. The Neutron Man was the Dancing Man. So we combined the two. There was not a Buckeye Man, so we started making a jersey. 2000, there was a contest called Loudest College Fan. That was what I entered. I was very fortunate to win that. That took me off to the National Scream Off. That then opened the door for uh, participation in a lot of Ohio State activities, such as the parade. 2002, we started giving uh, Buckeyes to every new student that came to Ohio State. I've actually been doing that since 2002. And now, this is like 15 years later, we've actually given the university about 30000 a year. These fans have their Buckeye pride on display, but it takes a lot of time to look the part. Well, that, that's a good question. It depends on First Lady Nut because she doesn't like being called Mrs. Big Nut anymore. So First Lady Nut, uh, it, in a good, when she's in a good mood, about an hour and a half. A bad mood, maybe up to two hours. You know, Asia, I can't imagine the time and the preparation it takes for those fans to get all painted like up, painted up like that for the games. <laughs> I'm more concerned about how long it takes to wipe it all off. You know, probably just about equally as long as it takes them to travel to the away games, and we've been to all of them this season, with the exception of California, of course. And some fans did make that game. I talked to a lot of fans this season who told me that traveling hours on the road and by plane was all just part of the fun. I've got about a five hour drive ahead of me on the way to the game, but I'm not the only one. For us, it was six hours because we got in one of the worst traffic jams ever. You're bound to experience a little rough traffic when traveling to the four away games of the season. Fortunately, the 3,345 miles of commuting will put you in some good company. We went to a parking lot on campus and uh, there were, it was like, Probably 90% Ohio State fans there, so it's pretty cool. It's amazing looking at their student section, seeing how it's not built and how that's not how it is. And whether you're at the Ohio Stadium, Northwestern's Ryan Field, Illinois' Memorial Stadium, or... I was at the Purdue game two weeks ago, and we were able to do the stadium OHIO like 10 times. So yeah, it, it's typical. Ohio State, we travel very well. Buckeye fans will be there all the same. It's awesome to come support your team on the road. Buckeye Nation is awesome. We'll, we'll go anywhere. Buckeye football, we will travel wherever, whenever. And when it comes to making the trip up to Ann Arbor. I'm so excited. I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. For Buckeye TV, I'm Asia Gore. You know, Asia, talk about dedication by Buckeye Nation there. Well, it is Ohio State we're talking about here. With a living alumni base of more than one million graduates, there's sure to be a sizable section of Scarlet Wearers in every stadium. That's right, and just because they aren't roaming the sidelines on Saturdays anymore doesn't mean they have forgotten about the intensity of this historic rivalry. Buckeye TV talked with some notable Buckeyes about what it was like to be at the very heart of this tradition. I've been watching that one since I was old enough to watch TV and will do so forever. To be introduced to it, I knew all about it. I mean, this is this is one of those kind of things. If you if if you enjoy college athletics, which I do, and particularly college football, one knew all about that. The measurement of your Ohio State career is how you did against Michigan, and when you've got that type of measurement, then you want to make sure that you take care of business uh, when it comes uh, to that game. That week of the game, it was almost like something took you over if you were a participant. And I remember going to the stadium, it was up at the big house, and, and I remember that the entire first quarter of the game, I was kind of like uh, despondent. I was no help whatsoever as a coach. I was just kind of... When I was president of the university, I got very, very nervous. I would wander around, I'd go uh, on third down calls, I'd go hide out, whatever I could do. Their quarterback, uh, Dennis Franklin, uh, he, he may had a quote uh, that Woody put up on our bulletin board and it stayed there for years. And the quote said that only the good ones go to Michigan. And what he was talking about was the Ohio players, only the good Ohio players were the ones that would go to Michigan. 
instead of coming to Ohio State because there was no question that Woody and Bo recruited uh, the same players. And a lot of guys, even myself, uh, you know, when we were deciding on what schools we were going to go to, Michigan was one of those choices, and, and it was a hard choice. Uh, but, uh, you know, only the good ones go to Michigan. You know, that was something that motivated me, and I'm sure it motivated others as well. I remember watching Braxton in ninth grade at our youth camp, and I remember going up to him and telling him, hey, are you going to be ready to take over for Terrell Pryor? And he was in ninth grade then. He said, absolutely. And uh, so, yeah, I'm very proud of those young men. We have every expectation that it's going to be a great game, and I'm certain it will be. I wish I were going to be there to cheer them on, but they will hear shouts and screams from Salt Lake City. Wow. Great to hear from former President Gee and two Buckeye legends reflect on their experiences with the Ohio State community. Considering those voices all came from the sidelines, a group of fans can share some equally as rich but different game day memories. That's right. The Block O section of the OSU fans are some of the loudest and most dedicated Buckeyes around. They're always getting the crowd fired up and they never turn down a chance to talk with Buckeye TV, TV reporters about their love for the Scarlet and Gray. Franz Ross certainly didn't have to twist any arms to get some reactions from the Block O. He joins us from the Block O motherland, the Ohio Stadium. It's the largest youth organization on campus. Celebrating its 75th year of existence, you can make sure the Block O is as loud as ever. And it started in 1938, so this is our 75th anniversary actually, with a man named Clancy Isaac who was part of the Spirit Squad back then for the football team and he decided that he wanted to create a student section that would help kind of increase the in-game atmosphere. And now we are about 2,500 people strong. We're the largest student organization um, at this university. While Blanco is certainly known for football, the organization is a lot more diverse than most people think. Well, Blanco is much bigger than just football. We actually started the Nut House quite a few years ago, and now the Nut House has expanded to be the amazing beast that it is. We have sections from everything from soccer, gymnastics, men and women's hockey, uh, just all across the board. We even have a baseball section this year. This stadium will be empty when Ohio State plays Michigan in two weeks, but you can make sure that Block Yeah, so what we do for that game is we just bring it to a whole next level. Unfortunately, for my point of view, we do have to go up north this year. We are bringing a whole group of Block O members, so it'll probably be 70 of us on a bus, plus all the other students, and we'll try to turn the big house into a Buckeye house. Uh, Ohio State and uh, Block O road trips were actually founded revolving around the Ohio State-Michigan football game to go to Ann Arbor and the big house to watch the game. That was actually the first Block O road trip, but... The, the rivalry is so much more than a game, so much more than a week, so much more than jumping in a lake or giving blood. or It's, it's a part of something so much bigger than we are. And it's, it's a magical thing, and it's important for Ohio State. It's important for the students in Ann Arbor. So it's important to get the Buckeye win two weeks from this Saturday. You may find imitators out there, but any true Buckeye fan will know that there's only one block out. For Buckeye TV, I'm Franz Ross. The Block O section's support is unwavering, though I guess they might have to be given their name. They have almost become the 12th man out there for the Buckeyes. Those fans are hard to miss on game day. One man is just as big a fan, maybe even more so, a little bit less blatantly obvious. While earlier we showed you fans that painted their faces, wore extreme costumes, and chanted as loud as they could, another fan shows his dedication with his attendance record. We are joined in studio by John Crawford, an Ohio State alumnus who refuses to miss a home game. John, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you. Here's my game face. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Now, I, I understand you've been to every single home game since 1943. Is that correct? 43, 70 years, yes. Well, In fact, uh, the Indiana game, it was my 440th. 440. Wow. Cost a fortune, I'll tell you. <laughs> now, what has it been like for you going to these games? Like, how do you still have that same passion that you had all those years ago? Well, I got to admit that some days is, I don't have quite the passion. But it's, uh, it's become a, a habit of me, and from the very first time, and I was a cheerleader in 53 and 4, and that's when it really started to hit me. When you're down there and there's a hundred some thousand fans that instantly jump up when someone takes off on a long run or something, the excitement in there, it's always amazing because I think everyone in there for that time, you kind of forget whatever's outside the stadium what's happening in the world, how you're doing, whatever. You come in and you think about the Buckeyes 
the band and the team, and the, the spirit is amazing. And I, I, I love it, evidently. <laughs> Keep doing it. Yeah, and uh, obviously this shows about the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry. Uh, many people consider it the greatest rivalry in all of sports. What does that rivalry mean to you? Well, <laughs> generally it's, you know, it's the end of the season. It means different things at different times. It means success for the team and bowl invitations and so forth. And of course, my, I think my, the best Michigan game for me, obviously, is the last year I officially cheered, which was 1954. And we beat Michigan 21 to seven. And we had a goal line stand at the south end and we stopped them on the one foot line, then marched 99 yards to the Big Bear store. Yeah, well, you wouldn't even know it was there, would you? <laughs> Outside the north of the stadium was a big bear store. That's what we talked about. But uh, the excitement is always the greatest because also it was the last game of the year. So it culminated in that game. And during uh, the 10 year war with Woody and Bo, that's where it really took off because they were such good friends and great competitors that they made it, they made it what it is today, I think. Now, is there any excuse out there that would cause you to miss a game? Death. <laughs> <laughs> well. I guess. Uh, I've, been, I've been sick a lot of times, and I've had to leave in a hurry. Uh, when was it, 90? When was it, 92? Anyway, my nephew was getting married in uh, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, he was getting married at 7, and the game was at noon. And Channel 6, uh, 6 on your side, helped me with a helicopter ride from the stadium to the airport. Wow. I flew to Jersey, changed my tux in, into the tux in the restroom, rented a car, and I got to the wedding, and actually I was greeting everyone as they came in. Because wow. I was there first. That's the closest I come to really missing. That is and, uh, wild. <laughs> uh, but uh, fortunately, health and where I've been in the world, and I've had four daughters and a family, and that's never been a conflict. They, they choose not to get married on those days, which is Well, good for them. <laughs> They're good. smart. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for being with us, John. We really appreciate yeah, John, it. Well, it was a pleasure. pleasure. <laughs> it went by so quick, and I had more to say. <laughs> there, I got it in. <laughs> Well, when we return, our game day experts join us here at the desk to break down the teams and who they project will have the upper hand. We'll be back after this quick timeout. I tell students, whether they're medical students or undergraduate students coming here, Ohio State University is a way of life and that it will impact them professionally and personally for the rest of their lives. Students coming to OSU get to grow and things come at them and that allows them to see themselves in a totally new light where they can see themselves in the world and what they will be able to accomplish. Everyone puts students first. It's the support structure that's at Ohio State and it's, it's there, it's deliberate, you'll find it like that. It's this living, breathing place that is there to provide all these opportunities and, and all these challenges for us to really help us become uh, the best that we can be. And I think we deliver on that promise every day. Welcome back, viewers. You're watching Buckeye TV's Rivalry Game Special. I'm Brad Gilmer. And I'm Asia Gore. Thanks for joining us. Now, just before the break, we talked about one of the most important aspects of the annual matchup, you the fans. With more than one million living alumni and a current student population that contends with few for having the most students enrolled, well, there are a lot of Buckeyes out there. Cheers to that, Asia. And many bar owners in the surrounding campus area would say the same as they prepare for the big game day rush. Our own Jordanelle would stop by a few of these area hotspots and talk with the GMs. Let's see what they had to say. As 
as the Buckeyes gear up to take on that team up north, campus bars are stocking up for the biggest game of the season. Fourth Street Bar and Grill and Midway on High get prepared for the Michigan game after remembering last year. Last year's Michigan game was cr absolutely insane. Um, we were packed from the minute our doors opened at 11 to all throughout the night and pretty much ran out of everything. Um, it's not that we didn't have enough ordered, we just physically didn't have enough space. The staff at Midway plans festivities for not only the game, but for Michigan Week as well. Last year's Mirror Lake, we kind of we kind of just threw together at the last minute, and we didn't really anticipate everyone trying to get into the bar half naked without IDs. So we're going to try to put together some sort of power hour or something before the jump to get kids in beforehand rather than anticipate the crowd for afterwards. Leading up to the main event, the bars make sure to be prepared and fully stocked. We usually increase our par for our liquor and beer by at least probably two. So we twice as much, and then we have staff that comes in earlier. We'll probably have a full staff. Because it's away this year, we're not anticipating the crowd we had last year. However, you know, it is Michigan week and things can get crazy. So we'll probably have Hall hands on deck ready to go. Both bars are planning to have regular game day specials, but are hoping to get the fans fired up. Do kegs and eggs, so we'll open it in the morning. We'll have a little buffet going and uh, just try to make it as enjoyable for everyone as we can. Jordan Elwood, Buckeye TV. Thanks, Jordan. I am joined now by Jeff Hammersley and Darius Thigman, two of our football analysts here that talk the nitty gritty about the rivalry game. Uh, thanks for joining me, fellas. Oh, it's great to be here. Ready to talk some Ohio State football. What Absolutely. about you, Jeff? I'm so pumped to talk about you, Ohio State football. You know, right we don't have enough time to talk, you know, what we really <laughs> want to talk about for, you know, for hours possibly. But uh, the history of this game is it's unlike any other in sports. Uh, and due to the large success between these two programs, like really what makes this rivalry as big as it is, Darius? Oh, yeah. I mean, looking at, I mean, off the field, on the field, it doesn't matter. These two schools don't like each other. These two programs have the huge rivalry going back and forth. And, of course, I mean, it's been a ton of good games back and forth throughout the years. I mean, absolutely. And Cooper had a couple undefeated, like three undefeated seasons in Ohio State in the 2000s with Trestle. It's, it's been a great rivalry down the stretch. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, obviously both schools share a number of Big Ten championships. And even though we have a Big Ten championship game this year, that game at the end of the season really determined the Big Ten championship, not just the league championship, but a birth to the Rose Bowl. Well, yeah, for years that was a national semifinal, basically, because back mm -hmm. in the old day there was no BCS championship game. It was whoever was number one at the end of the year, and it was usually between Ohio State and Michigan. So you had those years where that was a national semifinal, then the Rose Bowl was a championship game. Yeah, I agree totally with that. It's like Ohio State, Michigan, Rose Bowl implications and Big Ten title implications on the line almost every single time they played. Now let's uh, go ahead and fast forward. The Buckeyes are 10-0 uh, and 0 this season. Uh, Michigan 7-3. and 3. I mean, the record looks good on paper, but if you watch those games, it seems like overtime is their favorite time to play in a game. Um, let's talk about... Uh, some strengths yeah. Michigan has, despite, you know, we've seen the record. What kind of strengths does, you know, that team up north have come in to the big game that's going to be in the big house? Well, one of the obvious uh, strengths they have is that they have a dual threat quarterback, and it's even more so than with Denard Robinson. It was really run first. They now have a guy who can go out and throw the ball, throw for 300, almost 400 yards. We've seen Devin Gardner put up some huge numbers. And, Jeff, I mean, not just that, but their, yeah. I mean, receiving game has really stepped up as well. Yeah, you have guys like Jeremy Gallon over 1,000 yards catching on seven touchdowns. It's really, that is where their weapon's at. It's Gardner passing to Jeremy Gallon. Yeah. You know, um, you know, seven and three, they really aren't playing like the Wolverines of old, those teams we've been talking about from whether it was the 10-year war or in the 90s. Um, what are, some, what are those weaknesses that Michigan has this year that's really been holding them back? Well, I mean, they have a couple of different weaknesses. I mean, the one I'm going to get into is the defense. They've given up a ton of points. I mean, against teams like Penn State, Indiana, they've looked out of sorts defensively. And those are teams that, you know, I mean, are good offenses, but not necessarily elite. I mean, and, I mean Michigan's gotten torched in some of those games. I'm going to go with their O-line. They cannot protect between Gardner and uh, their running back here, Fitzgerald to some. I mean, that's where you got to win the game at. If you yeah. can't help uh, Fitzgerald gain running lanes, you're not going to win any ball games. Yeah, you can't block, you can't move the ball. And they struggled in most of their games this season. Yeah, I understand that uh, the line, and especially at secondary, they're all about freshmen and sophomores right, right. now, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a really young team as well. I mean, they have some of their senior leaders, but for the most part, that's a team that's still growing. And, and they're still a program overall that's trying to transition from the last couple of years and, and get the new regime in.
it's really they're coming from the Rich Rod days into the Brady Hoke days, and that takes a lot of time to really get your own guys, get your own footing, and your own recruits to come in and play for you. Now we can't forget there is another team that's going to be playing in this game. We've talked a lot about Michigan. Uh, <laughs> 10-0 this year for the Buckeyes. Uh, great year at about. They possibly could go 25-0. Yeah. What are the strengths for the Ohio State Buckeyes coming into that big game? Well, the one big strength, I mean, obviously is going to be the running game. So that comes down to two components. The offensive line, which is definitely the strength of the team, and the running backs themselves. Carlos Hyde. I mean, you look at so many guys that you can point to. Jordan Hall, Ezekiel oh, Elliott, yeah. Dontre Wilson. They would all be number one backs on different teams. They're just another one of the guys on Ohio State. Uh, between the running game and the defensive line, those are the two things. As you said, Darius, with Hyde, Hall, and just that running game, you just cannot stop Ohio State's running game. And then their defensive line, they put some pressure on your quarterback, sacks, fumbles, and even picks at times. And, uh, you know, obviously we just talked about Ohio State, 20, 22-0 right now. That's just unthinkable in college yeah. football these days. But the polls don't really like Ohio State too much. Uh, maybe it's those weaknesses they have. Can you kind of share the weaknesses they've been going through this well, year? Well, one of the big weaknesses is overall defense. The secondary has had its issues. And coming in, you really thought it was going to be a strong point. And they have had their injuries as well. I mean, right now you've got Corey Brown, Pitt Brown playing mm -hmm. at safety and, you know, C.J. Barnett and Christian Bryant coming into year, you think those are two of the guys that are going to lead this secondary, mm -hmm. and then you have that going down with Christian Bryant. And yeah. it's, it's, it's been unfortunate, but they have figured out ways to weather the storm. Yeah, injuries is the big thing. Also, in a couple of their games between Northwestern, they gave up, what, 30 points. Northwestern then fell apart. That hurt Ohio State. And then giving up 35 to Illinois, also not doing Ohio State any favors in the polls. You know, 10-0, uh, and 0, Michigan 7-3, and 3, that's really a game. You just throw away the records, you know. Of course. So many of those teams in the 90s were – Probably was some of the best Buckeye teams in history. But, you know, Michigan teams like that were able to, you know, take them down mm -hmm. and the upset happened. But before we go into our game predictions, your favorite OSU Michigan memory this in that game, what would it be? Oh, easy for me. 2005. That's the year before the game of the century of mm -hmm. the millennium. 2005, mm -hmm. you have Troy Smith, virtually unknown outside of Columbus at that point. He goes in. He has a great day. And, of course, the game-winning drive. The pass to Anthony Gonzalez. Oh, caught by Gonzalez. <laughs> that got me into broadcasting. I tell you what, man, that was a fun game to watch. Keith that, Jackson. Man. That just got mm. me going, man. For me, I was at the game of the century. As a seventh grade, my dad took me to that one. He, 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 he won the Ohio State football honor for that game. So it was like, whoa. I mean, just seeing Troy Smith, just the environment, one versus two. I mean, Michigan, I remember, they drove down the field, opening drive, scored. And it's thinking, I'm thinking, Bo the day after Bo Beckler dies, this Michigan team, mm -hmm. they, they're playing inspired. They're going to bring oh, yeah. everything they got. Then Ohio State between Smith and company, the couple touchdowns running down the south end zone. It's like, this is amazing. And then in the end, Ohio State won 42-39. Yeah. You know, I'm going to go with the 2002 game. Uh, of course. It's just, I remember that, that last drive, uh, John Navarre is taking them inside, yeah. almost in the red zone. Will yeah. Allen picks them off in the end zone. They get a chance to go to the national championship. And obviously, we know the rest is history. Uh, let's, what about your favorite tradition outside the game? All right. Uh, I'm, I kind of feel like I'm pressured to go in Mirror Lake, but I'll just go with the whole – Referring to Michigan and not actually not referring to Michigan during no, that yeah, week. Yeah, I was going to say. You say everything <laughs> except that. You refer to them as that team up north, that school up north. You don't say the actual M word during that week. For me, it's putting the scarlet tape on all the M's on campus. It's, it's just so cool because last year as a freshman, I was like, what's all the scarlet? Why? The I don't know oh, what this Endon Hall place oh, is. Oh, yeah. The, all the M's are out. It's Michigan week or the school up north week as Darius. You can't say the Michigan word during the Michigan week. I just said it twice right there. But either way, <laughs> it's the whole thing is just amazing. It's great to be part of this rivalry. All right, Darius, Jeff, thanks for joining us. That's all the time we have right now. Uh, when we come back, they brought you the Little Mermaid, uh, the Miller Mermaid, the Golden Snitch in. And so many more. The best damn band in Atlanta have just had a spectacular season right now on the field. We'll have more on that when we come back. It's really the whole set of traditions. It's the buildings, it's the campus. What the football tradition, the OHIO tradition, all of that stuff does is it makes people feel this intimate connection with each other. It's a feeling that the students are part of something bigger than themselves. Woody Hayes talked to us as football players about paying forward. Well, I think that's caught on uh, with uh, Ohio State because uh, people do pay forward. They like doing things to help others. This is definitely 
the university if you're going to make a difference in the world. And that's wonderful to be a part of. To know that I have all the tools going out in, in the world, you know, is a, a big credit to Ohio State and I really think is going to help me in, in being able to achieve those goals in medicine and being able to affect a greater change. This place has in its essence the ability to take somebody who doesn't come in with a lot and give them a lot. Experiences that no one else can match. It changes lives. Welcome back. You're watching Buckeye TV's Rivalry Game Special. I'm Asia Gore. And I'm Brad Comer. Thanks for being with us this evening. We broke down the game for you just moments ago with our sports analysts. They gave their predictions on which team would walk out Michigan Stadium as the true victors. Now we're joined by Rithika Shaw to give you not only the statistical breakdown for these teams, but all the things you've wanted to know about this big game. Rithika, tell us a little more about these two teams. Well, thanks, Asia and Brad. The rivalry really brings out the smack talk from players on both sides of the stands. But what it really comes down to at the end of the game are the numbers. Looking at this season, Ohio State leads the rushing yards by 3,151 to Michigan 1,357. And for total passing yards, they're much closer. Michigan narrowly beats the Buckeyes on that one. When we look at total points, Ohio State has the nod offensively with 484 to Michigan's 340. These points push Ohio State past its record points scored in one season, which was previously in 1995. Defensively, these teams are eye-to-eye -eye on the total defensive interceptions, but Michigan has the upper hand on the yardage. Now this rivalry rests on a strong history, so let's take a look at the results from the past 10 years. Since 2003, Ohio State has won 8 out of 10 meetups. The biggest victory for the Bucks came in 2010 when they beat the Wolverines 37-7. to They haven't lost to that team up north since 2011. The Buckeyes will be sporting their new rivalry jerseys at this away game. The design was just released earlier this week, and the Nike design features white pants and jerseys with red numbers and letters. The Bucks will still wear their chrome helmets that they wore for the first time during the big game last year. And that's a look at the numbers. Now back to you guys at the desk. Those are certainly some interesting statistics. Thank you, Ithaca. Now, before we move on to the band, there's one other individual that gets Buckeye Nation fired up on those Saturdays. That's right. He's not quite as loud as the band. In fact, he doesn't make any sound at all, but he sure knows how to work a crowd. Gina Davis joins us to tell us about the always energetic Brutus Buckeye. Familiar with Brutus Buckeye. You can find him at games firing up fans and doing some cool halftime acts, but he hasn't always looked the same. The cheerleading team is now in charge of designing Bruce's look, but it was Ray Boris and Sally Hoover who came up with the idea in 1965. The first Brutus appeared at the Minnesota vs. Ohio State homecoming game. The mascot was made of paper mache, but was soon replaced by a fiberglass shell. There was a campus-wide contest to come up with the name, and Brutus was finally born. <laughs> Brutus is a really talented nut. I've seen him out there doing gymnastics with the cheerleaders, punting the ball, you name it. Can't forget up the can't forget those push-ups he does after all those touchdowns they score. But do you think old Brutus could hang with the marching band? Ooh, maybe the drums? He should probably leave that one to the experts. And the Ohio State marching band, uh, just like that, performing an intricate halftime show each and every week these past few weeks, gaining worldwide attention. Ritika Shaw tells us more about what makes the marching band the best damn band in the land. Ohio State marching band has been wowing Buckeye fans with their popular halftime shows. The band members sure seem like they know how to cross their T's and dot their I's. But now all eyes will be on them as they travel to Ann Arbor for the matchup against Michigan. 
Well, the Michigan game is certainly the uh, penultimate of our season, and uh, we, our students pride ourselves in making, uh, in making that show the very best of the season. This year, the Ohio State Marching Band has made Michael Jackson come back to life, recreated a battle between pirate ships, led Superman to save a falling building, enabled a Tyrannosaurus Rex to eat a Michigan fan, and flew Harry Potter to victory in catching the Golden Snitch. Bands say they have high expectations for what the Michigan Halftime Show will bring. Um, well, I think it's going to be really hard to top some of their last performances. I mean, Harry Potter catching a snitch was incredible. Um, and there's a fair bit of pressure because it is the Michigan game. But, I mean, every game has been an incredible performance. And especially as like, we're like rounding out the semester, I think that it's just going to be a big burst of energy. And they're going to put a lot into it. They bring a huge, like, electricity during, like, halftime. Because most people, like, for most football games, you, like, leave like the state go out into like the concession area for like halftime but at osu hardly anyone does that just because the band's so good while fans say they are captivated by the marching band's electric energy band members say they thrive off of the negative energy they receive in michigan stadium we go into the big house and it's the most hostile atmosphere that a performer can ever really go to um, the booze the threats, the screams, and we just feed off of that energy. We look forward to it every year. They're, they're booing us like you wouldn't believe. We march script Ohio and we pound our feet into the turf so that when we march off the field, little remain of Ohio, you know, is still stuck in their field. It wouldn't be the rivalry without it. One of the things that we do do is march into there and we do feed off that energy. If we're not getting a reaction from the crowd, then we're not doing our job. So if it's positive or it's negative, you know, it better be there because we're there too. This matchup will be the final game in the Buckeyes regular season, but what sets it apart from any other game? Any other game? This is the biggest college football we're rivalry ever. So one thing is, is we get to be a part of history. That's a big part. We get to be a part of the tradition and the excellence that comes out of this university. And it's a really great thing to be a part of. Reporting for Buckeye TV, I'm Ritika Shah. The legacy of the band continues on even after the players turn in their plumes. Earlier this season, we saw a great performance by the band that partner with the Ohio State Alumni Band, graduates of the best damn band in the land, who continue to, to, continue to perform. We're joined by a few of them now. Thanks for being with us. The band never ceases to amaze fans with elaborate formations and exceptional music. What was it like to be a part of that, and how has it stuck with you? Do you want me to start? I'll start. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, my first game as a freshman at Ohio State was 1954. We were undefeated that year, and John Crawford has talked to you a little bit already about uh, the cheerleader side of that game. Uh, after the game, the fans stormed the field. The Michigan band tried to get on the field, did not succeed. They were snake danced through. It was not a good, uh, a good start to the relationship as I saw it, but. Uh, I think the bands themselves have a good grudging respect for each other, and uh, that's the way I looked at it as a member of the band and, and my years as director. We think the Michigan band is a very good band. It's the hype of the game that gets in the way of any real friendship. Now, uh, watching the band today and hearing about a lot of these performances that they've had in halftime in recent weeks, whether it's Michael Jackson or the Hollywood Blockbusters uh, performance, what does that mean to you with how they're doing this season? I think what they've been doing, not only this year, but last year, is, is they've taken it to a whole different level. Uh, when, when I was in band back in the 90s, we, we had some pretty intricate drills, but nothing like what we've seen today. And it's just, it's amazing what they're doing. And Jonathan Waters, the band director, told us that the Michigan game is something the band prepares for all year long. What was that game day like for you? Being a member of the marching band and going to Michigan, preparing for it all year long, you just you knew it was the last game of the season. Uh, it didn't matter what happened all year long, but as long as you beat Michigan, two things that you remember is beat Michigan and go to the Rose Bowl. So uh, just preparing for that Michigan game, practice all week long. You're practicing a lot harder. Uh, when the game was at home, uh, the ramp coming out of the pregame was a lot faster for the Michigan game, and you just your heart's just beating out of your chest when you're marching down the field. And what's it like to watch the, the band now today? Do you guys have like an overwhelming amount of pride? Is Mickey miss being on the band? Uh, I do. I think it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, the current band makes us alums look good.
Awesome. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go to a break, but when we come back, the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry gives back to the community. And we have more special guests who may put you in tune with your Buckeye pride. Stay with us. have to be here very long to know that this Buckeye thing is amazing. It doesn't matter if you think you don't have spirit, you will, because it's everywhere and it's contagious. It's really hard to put your finger on it, but it's just a feeling that you don't get until you realize that you are a student or a faculty member at one of the greatest universities in the world. I love Ohio State University. I think it is a grand institution. There is a spirit about Buckeyes that I think resonates throughout the world. It just hits you when you walk on this campus, the feeling that people have and that they carry with them for generations. That's what the tradition does. If you're just now tuning in, this is the Buckeye TV Rivalry Game Live Special. I'm Asia Gore. And I'm Brad Comer. We're talking about the clash of the Scarlet and Gray in that team up north, the legendary Ohio State-Michigan game. Thanks for being with us. Throughout the show, we've talked to members of the band, the biggest fans, and have shared with you some of the history that makes this game day what it is. But it's not all about tailgating and halftime shows. Different organizations are using this rivalry as a platform to give back to the community. Mm -hmm. Alexandra Chapin tells us what makes some fans Buckeyes for life. As the Buckeye football team prepares to take on that team up north, some other Buckeyes are taking on the Wolverines for a good cause. Donate Life partners with Buckeyes for Life and their ultimate goal is to save lives. Volunteers have been talking to fans outside the shoe before football games asking them if they're organ donors. OSU is trying to beat Michigan this year and sign up more Buckeyes to be organ donors. For student and Buckeyes for Life president Shelby Reamer, the cause is one that hits home. Shelby is a recipient of a tissue donation. We're trying to make sure that Ohio State students know that they can make a difference and one person that signs up one other person could potentially save a life. So it's an organization where um, students actually have a chance to make an actual difference in the community. Donate Life is using the rivalry between OSU and Michigan to fuel the donation initiative. But even the big nut said this is much bigger than any football game. It's phenomenal that somebody with that big of a heart, a bigger heart than the size of the state of Ohio, to give of yourself to somebody else tells, speaks volumes of the kind of person that you were when you were you know, here on the earth. And I mean, that's, that's, that's the ultimate gift to give is, uh, is you have yourself to somebody else to keep them alive. That's, that's amazing. And that ultimate gift was given in the wake of tragedy by Jerry Price's late son. I got involved with Lifeline of Ohio when uh, we lost our son about nine years ago due to an assault. And they um, were able to save eight other individuals and make their Im impact on their life a lot better than what they were going through at that time. Buckeyes fans have the opportunity to beat Michigan and to save a life. Reporting for Buckeye TV Special Edition, I'm Alexandria Chapin. That's a very touching story. Great work that they're doing there. You know, Asia, they're not the only, or, uh, they're not the only ones. Another organization is talking about the game as well. They're taking that to the dinner table. Al Spicani has this story. Battle Against Hunger is a competition between Ohio State and Michigan with collecting canned goods. Uh, it's really like, even though it's a competition, it's obviously meant to like, it's good for Michigan and Ohio State to both be raising a lot of canned goods. And it's a way to like fuel that process because obviously we want to beat each other. It's 15 to 16 different diverse organizations, so we can have, we have someone from Racquetball Club, 
We have yoga club. We have biomedical engineers who are doing with us. We really wanted to make sure that we were making a difference with our swimmers and having them think of someone other than themselves. And when we have a swim meet with this many people, it's great to be able to do something good for other people. Some of the collaborations we're doing, such as the one we're doing here, is actually bringing in student, well, kids from the age of five up until college kids. And uh, each one is trying to support their school or support their district. And um, it really is bringing together the Columbus community more than just the Ohio State community alone. But it's really trying to affect our community and affect the Ann Arbor community as well. We're trying to fight hunger. That's really what the program is like in its essence. And in order to do that, making it bigger is just better. We're going to be able to raise more food and then we're going to be able to impact the community at a larger level. And that's, that really is what the event is about. You know, it's great to see uh, the game being used to, uh, you know, to kind of accomplish a lot of great things that's been doing. Mm. Yeah, and as we get ready for this big game on Saturday next week, um, let's take a look at our weekly weather forecast to see what the game should bring. Thanks, Asia and Brad. As you see, it's going to be a great day for football. November 30th is when Ohio State takes on Michigan, and we're predicting a temperature around 45 degrees, mostly sunny skies, a slight breeze coming in from the southeast, 3 to 6 miles an hour. Now let's break this down for you for your day planner. So if you are planning on traveling up to that state up north for the game, here's what it's going to look like. Your morning, it's going to start off around 35 degrees, mostly sunny skies. As we continue on throughout the day, as you see, there will be a warm up, especially around game time, getting up to about 40 degrees, mostly sunny skies, and will cool off as nightfall comes on. If you're watching the game here in Columbus, we also do have your day planner laid out for you here too. As you see, starting off the morning, just about the same, a little bit warmer, 37 degrees. Moving on throughout the day, that warm up will be present as you see around game time, starting off at 45, mostly sunny skies, and then for nightfall, hitting around 37 degrees. Uh, winds from the southeast, four to six miles an hour. And then for your fashion forecast, if you do have plans to head out afterwards or even dressing for the game, make sure you have on that Buckeye gear representing that scarlet and gray. And then also dress in warm layers and make sure you have that hat, scarf, and gloves handy. Thanks, guys. Back to you in the studio. Thank you, Mackenzie. Well, that's going to do it for us here at Buckeye TV. We hope that you've all learned about the spirit of the big rivalry game and had a chance to see how it all became. We will be in Ann Arbor, in Ann Arbor with the coverage along with a post-game recap of the 109th edition of the game. For Brad and myself and everyone here at Buckeye TV, thanks for joining us and we hope you enjoyed it. And before we call it a night for our live special, we've got a special live performance from Ohio State's very own acapella group, Buck That. Take care, everyone.
find satisfaction. You let the snake, then you eat your food, and then you shop, shoot till you find satisfaction. Oh, no, no. Oh, 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 no. O